that would work. All right, so let me get started here. All right, so. So this first one is called Developing a Photographer's Eye. And so what it is, is that when I first started in uh, photography, I started photography in college, by the way, not that it's that interesting, but I started photography in college, I didn't start in high school, um, uh, was a music musician, professional musician, did stuff like that. Anyways, we took a photography class at, at a community college, just like you're taking. Um, and the teacher that I had, Mr. Leary, great guy, lovely person um him and i didn't quite see eye to eye we sort of butted heads a lot he was a very technical person i was not at the time um i was sort of figuring out where i wanted to go so um but i loved it i was just it's totally enamored with photography and the concept of expressing myself through photography um so i transferred to san jose state and when i did uh, the first professor I got, who is now a good close friend of mine, Brian Taylor, um, started talking about developing your eye. Don't worry about the technical stuff. Develop your eye first, because technicals, a technical stuff to me will always change over time. Over time, we're going to get new cameras, new lenses, new computers, new all sorts of stuff. Um, and so that's great to keep up with it. But the, to me in photography, the more important part of it is developing your vision, developing, seeing things the way you want to create the, what you're uh, what you're seeing and how to express that to other people uh, is the is for me the more important thing. So uh, some of the stuff is real basic stuff, but other stuff is not. So I just thought I'd cover a few things. First of all, is I get questions all the time. People asking me like, "Hey, you know, what do you what? How do you take better pictures?" Um, so I, I sort of developed three things because my first class I ever taught, I made a list of like ten. And then I realized, you know what? No one wants to go to like Disneyland and have like a list of 10 things they have to do when they take pictures. So I make it three, make it real easy. Uh, first off is remember the camera can take vertical pictures too. I see all too many people only shooting horizontals. Now, what's funny is, is as time has gone by nowadays when people are taking pictures, it seems as if, and I'm sure you can probably see this, next time you're out and about and you're seeing people take pictures, well, I like to watch people sometimes. And when I watch people, I see people, when they take pictures with their phones, they take them horizontally, pretty much no matter what. Even I've been at Yosemite and, and been, you know, taking pictures of, of, uh, of Yosemite Falls, which is like 1,800 feet high, and they're shooting horizontals. Uh, that sort of makes more sense to go vertical. But what do people do when they shoot video? They do the exact opposite. They shoot videos up and down. So anyways, I digress. So remember the camera can take vertical pictures too. This is kind of an old picture of my son's. Uh, we were like in a hotel or something like that. It's nothing. The, the, the location of where we were isn't really important to the telling of the story. It's just that we were in a hotel or something like that. Nice pictures of my son's, but they're, but it's like, eh, eh. The problem is, is to me, is that there's lots of extra background when there doesn't need to be. The background for this isn't what's telling the story. So by taking the picture vertically instead, it changes the picture considerably to where now there's not as much background. Now it's 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 it sort of brings this brings them into the picture itself. And it's not just a simple crop. I didn't crop this. I actually turn the camera vertically. Okay? Uh, not every subject needs to be in the center of the frame. You know, you don't always have to have the subject right smack dab in the middle of the frame. If you were traveling, now that we can start to travel again, let's say you go to, um, you know, you go to Washington, D.C. If you took every single picture where the person that you're with or people that you're with were in the exact middle of the picture, um, you'd have some really boring pictures. So if I took a picture of my son, Thomas, this is a long time ago, kids, almost 20 now, <laughs> it was a while back, um, it's okay picture you know he's playing little league baseball and uh, uh it's okay uh do i have this printed out no do i have this as my screensaver uh, -uh. uh poster certainly not it's not you know why did that quit that was weird hang on a second here it's weird that it was sorry yeah, there it goes so uh why it quit like that i don't know anyhow uh so not a great it's not a bad picture but certainly not great it's not going to make my wall of fame so to speak uh this one now so this is a picture in which he's not smack dab in the middle of the picture. He's off to one side. He's leading us into this picture. To me, in this type of photograph, you can almost feel like you're the first baseman or you can almost feel like you're the umpire. Maybe you're going to call the 
person running first base out or safe or something like that. So it draws you into the picture much better than just putting people in the center all the time. So the first thing is more vertical. Second thing is not everything has to be dead centered in the picture. You can put it off center. Most of our cameras these days have the, have the ability to focus off center to where you don't have to put everything smack dab in the middle and the camera will figure out how to sort of approach that and focus correctly. The last of the three things is use the flash outdoors for pictures of people. So if your camera has a built-in pop-up flash, you think, wait a minute, it's bright outside. Why would I need a flash? That's most everybody's you know, concept is like, wait, why would I need a flash if I'm taking, if it's outside, there's plenty of light outside, right? Well, you get this. So there's my son, Scott. Uh, not the greatest picture of him ever, <laughs> quite honestly, uh, mainly because you can't really see his face. You know, it's not that, you know, it's not that inviting of a picture of him in front of this mission, um, San Juan Batista. So it's not that amazing of a picture. Uh, but if you put the flash on, so in order to do this on your camera, the camera has to be like in the program mode. Oftentimes your cameras have like a little green square. Like if you have a Canon camera, it has a green square or most cameras have some sort of green automatic mode. And this automatic mode prevents the flash from going up if it doesn't think it needs it. So the cool thing is, is you use the P or program mode. That way, if you use the flash, you, there's a little button on your camera, something that looks like a looks like a lightning bolt. So if you press that lightning bolt button, the flash goes, ting, pops up, and it will fire every time. So instead of this, you get that. So you get a much, much, much better picture of people outside because it gets rid of the shadows on their faces. And it, you think, well, what if it, well, will it, won't it blow it out? Won't it make it too bright? Um, it doesn't, that doesn't usually happen. Most of the time it hasn't happened. And besides digital, it's better to shoot extras, you know, shoot one with a flash, shoot one without a flash, see what turns out better and work from there. Uh, but, but putting your camera on the peer program mode will give you that capability. Okay. We're going to talk more about the program mode in just a moment. Okay, so a few things about lenses. Most of this, some of this we already know. Um, when we talk about these numbers, these numbers are not arbitrary, but depends on what camera you have. So we're going to convert all of our numbers to what we consider to be full frame. Now, out there, there's basically three types of cameras. There's full frame cameras. Sony, Canon, Nikon uh, make full frame cameras. Um, those are usually a little bit bigger in size. They're a little bit more expensive. And the sensor is slightly larger not doesn't always equate to better pictures just more expensive cameras there are some advantages uh, so we're going to use those numbers other people most everybody probably has a camera that's called an aps or advanced photo system aps size camera and the numbers are slightly different so most everybody in the class that i can see your pictures from has a and what's called aps so like the canon rebels uh your, your a lot of your sony's are the aps so this number 50 should be third in your world if you have a canon it should be 35. So that's what we see. 50 millimeters is what we see as humans. So what we see what's the equivalent to a 50, 50 millimeter lens are pretty close to it. Anything less than that, like 28 millimeters, or like if you have an 18 to 55 lens, would be equal to wide angle. So you're showing more in the picture. You're showing a wider field of view. Anything higher than 50 millimeters, like 300 millimeters, that's telephoto where it's bringing something distance in close. Okay, so we know this because we did this when we did our aperture assignment, where we did not only changes in the aperture, but we changed our angles of lenses. Now, some people have cameras that you, that you honestly can't really change the aperture, uh, but you can fool it by using different wide angle lenses and telephoto lenses. So what do we use these lenses for? Why, why do we zoom? Well, not just because it's a funny little thing to do, but because we can tell different stories. So if I go to Mission Santa Barbara, I would probably want to use a wide angle lens. If I'm going to, 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 uh, um, to Yosemite, I'd probably want to use a wide angle lens to tell that story. Uh, to, to This here is to tell the story of how large Mission Santa Barbara is, the, the largest of the missions. Um, or if I want to use something where I want to focus in on something, I want to bring something this distance close and make sure the audience knows exactly what I'm talking about, I can use a telephoto lens like this to bring things in super close. So you're not looking at the picture going, wow, they, they really clean that pool well, don't they? Uh, that's not the subject. That's not what you're looking at. You're looking at this little boy jumping into the water uh, for a swim class. Uh, so that's what a telephoto lens can do. So that's why we use the different lenses to sort of tell different stories uh, in photography. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about flash. Um, if your camera has a built-in flash, hang on a second. Yeah. 
if your camera has a built-in flash like that, that camera has a built-in little flash, those little built-in flashes can lead to very harsh shadows. If you have an external flash, a flash that goes on top of the camera gives you a ton more creative control. So let me show you some differences. If you have a built-in flash on your camera, the little pop-up, you tend to get pictures like this. So with this picture, there's a couple of problems. One is um, the, the horrible shadow in the background. You can see the shadow uh, on the wall in the background of the picture, uh, which, is, which is to me somewhat distract, detracting from the picture, as well as because the flash is so close to the lens, it's providing really what we call flat lighting. So the lighting is a really flat texture. So you, he doesn't really have a nose necessarily. You can't really see the color of his eyes all that well. And he's got some red eye issues going on as well. Um, so not bad, but certainly not what I would consider to be good. So with the, with the other flashes, the flashes where you put that on top of your camera, you don't have to shoot it straight out at something. You can do things where you can bounce it. So I take my flash and I bounce it up off the ceiling and it comes back down again and I can get pictures like like this. So that's the same the kid that's my older son Scott examining his brother Thomas. Thomas is the one in the picture on the left. And so now you can see the detail in his eyes. You can see that his face has contour that is, you know, his, you know, you can see a contour to it. It's a much more soft and natural type of look. And all I did was I took the flash and bounced it up off the ceiling and it's bouncing right back down again. So it's lighting it up vastly differently. So electronic flash is great, but we can be somewhat creative with it. We don't always have to fire it directly at our subjects. Uh, we do some other things with flashes as well. The internal flash, um, the built-in little pop-up guys, these guys never carry more than 15 feet. Um, and so when I'm talking about flash, I'm talking about an actual flash. If you thought about your phone, that's not a flash. That's a light that comes on and that's vastly different. But if we're talking about a flash, the built-in pop-up type never cover more than 15 feet, no matter what the situation. Um, so, or if you have an external flash, it can go quite a bit more different distance. So with the 15 foot rule, um, things, like, things, things like this next things happen. This is my graduation when I, grad, when I got my uh, master's degree. So it's at Brooks down in Santa Barbara. They have this theater. We walk across the stage. And as we walk across the stage, there's a movie playing that's an interview us. There's another screen that's showing our portfolios. Uh, it's a really neat thing. It's really pretty cool. Um, and so um, the person that was there with me brought their little uh, little tiny camera and I told them, don't put it on that mode with the flash. And they didn't listen. So here's me um, graduating. That's a great shot, huh? That's a great shot. Yeah, that's a great picture. I can put that in the album of me graduating with my master's degree with honors. That's great. So anyways, a larger flashes cover further distance. These big flashes do some really cool stuff like this. This is a high school football game, and I'm not anywhere near this person when I, talk, when I took the picture. And it's such a bright flash that not only is this person lit up, so they're probably a good 20, 25 yards away from me. Those bright reflections in the background are people's jackets where they have that little reflective strip on their, on their jacket. Okay, so uh, red eye. We don't get red eye that much nowadays because not a lot of people use flash as much, but we still get it once in a while. Red eye in your cameras, uh, what happens is, is it's a lot of cameras when you have a built-in flash, there's a little um, icon when you press that lightning bolt, you can go from like, uh, they, sometimes a, a setting is called fill flash where it's on all the time. Uh, one is called, uh, it has a, like a picture of an eyeball, which is red eye flash, it re but it only reduces it. It doesn't get rid of it. Uh, and then there's other things like second curtain and other issues. So we're going to talk red eye. The problem with red eye reduction in cameras is it only reduces it. Plus it takes a lot longer. You've probably had someone take a picture of you or you've seen someone take a, take a picture with red eye reduction. And when they take the picture, the flash goes, it'll, it'll, like, it'll go, it'll like fire, fire like 20 times and then take the picture or a light will come on for a couple seconds and then take the picture. Well, it's trying to reduce the red eye effect. It doesn't get rid of it though. We can also get rid of it in software, but there's ways to, there's techniques you can apply to get rid of red eye itself in your pictures. One of them is, is that understanding how the eye works and what happens is that when you take a picture, I'm going to get out of full screen for just a second out of that. So I can do this. Is when you take a picture with a flash, if I have my camera over here and I'm taking a picture and the flash comes in, 
because those flashes oftentimes on cameras are so close to the lens, the angle of reflection is almost right back at the lens. It's kind of like if you took a picture, uh, if you tried to take a picture of a bathroom and you had the flash aimed at the, at the mirror, it would hit the flash, it would hit the mirror and bounce right back at you. Um, whereas if you want to take a picture of a bathroom and not have any reflective, you could take it off to an angle. Another way to think of it is, if you've ever played pool, you know, like billiards, if you shoot the ball straight ahead, it bounces right back at you. But if you bounce the ball off to one side, it bounces around the, the, the billiards table around a couple of different ways. Light does the exact same thing. And then when we hit, uh, when we use our flash on our camera, that's really close. Yes, it's really close to the lens. It hits the eye. And because the viscous fluid inside your eye is really clear, it bounces right back out, hits the lens. So there's a couple things we can do to help reduce red eye without, without any software or the flash trick. Number one is you tend to have red eye in really dark areas because what happens is, is the pupils open up because we're trying to be more sensitive to light. So if you're in a bright situation, your pupils are really small. Bright, really dark situations, our pupils open up. So if you make it brighter in the room, it tends to make our pupils close down. So we tend to get red, less red eye. Uh, the house we used to live in when my sons were small, um, the, the family room faced east. And we had these three huge picture windows that, that you could open the blinds for. Well, Christmas morning, I'd go downstairs before the kids got up and I'd open all the windows open. I'd turn all the lights on and they'd get down there and like, it's like a movie set, dad. You know, it was really bright. And I'm like, yeah, but you're not gonna have, you won't have red eye. You won't ever have red eye because the pupils are so small. Uh, the second thing you can do um, that you can do in pictures, sorry, I'm trying to get my dog not to bark, um, is uh, zooming in slightly. So instead of taking the wide angle shot all the way back, you can take your lens and zoom in slightly and you tend to get a little bit less red eye. The other kind of interesting thing is that with different people, different red eye effects happen. For example, um, if you took a picture of me and my two sons, um, my older son, Scott, uh, yet to have red eye. He's 20, he's going to be 24. Um, <laughs> I have to remember what age he is. He never had red eye, not once. All the thousands and thousands and thousands of pictures I've taken that kid, not once has he had red eye. My son Thomas and I, we have it all the time because lighter colored eyes tend to have more red eye. So if we do this, let me move this back over here and hit play again. If you back up and zoom in, open the windows up a little bit, you can get pictures like that. So Thomas has very light color eyes, just like his dad. And so even with that, you can see the shadow from the flash on the picture. See that shadow behind his head? It was one of those cameras that has a flash that's pretty close. Uh, even with that, you can still see he doesn't have a lick of red eye. And that's not like a Photoshop. I didn't, this is straight out of camera. I didn't Photoshop it. Otherwise I would have fixed the drapes. Those are terrible drapes. <laughs> we had when we first moved into a house. All right, anyways, camera modes, let's move on. So portrait mode. Most cameras have some sort of portrait mode. And sometimes they have a little dial on the top that has this picture. Other times you have to go through like a menu to pick these out. These are sort of the more common, more popular ones. Uh, so portrait mode tends to put the subject in focus and the background out of focus. So it draws your eye to the subject. So this is my niece. And she doesn't look like she's standing, you know, being held. She's actually being held. That's her mom holding her. And it also too doesn't show that that's a grandfather clock in the background. So that's a grandfather clock in the background. Can't really see it because it's so far out of focus. It put her in focus and put the background out of focus. So it does that for you in the portrait mode. More modes, this is landscape mode. Puts everything in focus. Now also too, in case you're having problems with your camera, you're like the flash keeps popping up no matter what I do. If you put it in landscape mode, that prevents the flash from ever popping. The flash will never pop in landscape mode. So landscape mode does this, where it puts everything in focus. From the closest point to the furthest point, everything's 100% in focus. Macro or close-up mode, things like that. This is an orchid. So the orchid's about the size of like a, um, a shot glass, pretty small. Uh, so this is where the camera's really close inside there type, type thing. All right. Uh, night flash mode. This is a really cool mode. Fortunately, with six weeks, we didn't have time to play with this very much. But night flash mode, what happens is, is that when you take a night flash picture, is the shutter stays open a little bit longer 
in order to you get the flat the flash fires you know the flash will fire for the person you're taking a picture of but the shutter stays open a little bit longer to burn that background in so this is a weird way of saying it allows back, background light to register on an image so this is a regular picture that's me without a beard a long time ago um and so if you don't have that on you have laser beams coming out of your head um and but if you put the night flash mode on you get stuff like this this is at a place called the sacramento railroad museum so if you've ever been there it's kind of a cool place uh you know for what it's worth uh but it is literally a dungeon it is darker than dark in there and so this portrait of my sons uh is taken there and it's a longer exposure i know it's a longer exposure not only because i took it but if we look at the picture for just a second you can see behind them there's a, two, there's a little model train going by it's kind of a blur and on the far left hand side you can see someone's body is like a blur it's because the shutter stays open a little bit longer so you can use this not only for this type of effect so you're in Vegas, you're in a great restaurant or whatever, you want that background to burn in, you can do this. You can also do it in fact, as far as you, when you're moving the camera, trying things like this, seeing what happens with it. Okay. Uh, sports mode, we know this now. You guys are experts at this because sports mode captures the fastest shutter speed possible. So it does stuff like this. This is FA 18 Hornet. Uh, it's landing. So the problem with shutter, fast shutter speeds is it does exactly this, just like I talked about in the shutter speed assignment, where it stops, it stops the action. It stops the action dead. So you can't tell that this plane is landing at, you know, you know, let's say 130 miles an hour. Doesn't look like 130 miles an hour. It looks like it's hovering. So instead, you, we all know the technique because you all took that, the, did this uh, shutter speed assignment where we move the camera. So all I do is move the camera with the subject and I get pictures like this. This is an F-14 Tomcat landing type situation. So you can do all sorts of cool stuff. So last couple ones, uh, auto versus program mode. Auto means you've turned over the controls to the camera to say, you know what, you figure it out. And it's going to put the flash up when you want it, and it's not going to put it up when you don't want it. Okay, so to me, the auto mode doesn't really work all that well. The program mode, on the other hand, I really like the program mode. Most of my pictures are shot on the program road. Now, not my professional stuff. The professional stuff is something different because I'm doing stuff where I'm doing multiple flashes and all sorts of weird, wacky things. But when I'm out and about, uh, when I'm taking pictures for my own use, most of the time I have the camera on program mode. It's a weird sort of reasoning, but here's the reason why. These cameras aren't cheap, right? They cost a pretty good penny to buy these things. So you should use it for their advantage and their program mode does that. So if you're in the program mode and you're like, all I remember is he didn't say we had to memorize the apertures, but rather we had to memorize what the apertures did. So if you have a high number like 16, that's a small hole, puts everything in focus. If you're in the program mode and you text the, tap the shutter button, now you can turn the dial of your camera and it'll go to whatever aperture you want it to be. So you don't need to memorize the aperture. You just don't need to know that if you go to a high number like a F11, F16, everything's gonna be in focus. If you go to a low number, F4, you're gonna have a subject in focus, background out of focus. The program mode lets you do that. Every camera works the same. To where you just tap the button, tap the shutter button lightly. You don't take a picture. You just tap it lightly. It activates the, the metering in the camera, and now you can turn the dial to make it go to those different aperture settings. Everybody has a different way of thinking and acting and do and creating, and that's the the thing that I love the most about photography is everybody has their own way. For me personally, my inspiration for taking a picture can be fleeting. It can be like, it can be over in a heartbeat. Uh, and so I sort of need to take advantage of that quickly whenever I can. So to me, if I can make it easier on my brain, I can use less of the four or five brain cells left to try to figure out what aperture I should be and rather concentrate and go, you know what? I think vertical would work better here or whatever the setting would be. OK, so that's why I tend to use program mode most of the time outside of my professional work. OK, okay so we get out of that one. Now I have one other one, sort of a quickie one. This is a bit more technical, OK, but you'll but it's not super long. It's easy. OK, so when we talk about photography nowadays with digital, there is the technical stuff. There's the technical aspect of photography. Uh, and part of that technical aspect of it is that on our cameras, our cameras record 
different types of files. You may have seen when you gone went through the menu, you can record, it'll say JPEG or RAW. So we're gonna talk about RAW versus JPEG. Okay, so RAW versus JPEG is not a, necessarily a battle royale. Some people make it out to be, some people make it out to be that, that, that RAW is so much better than JPEG. There's reasons for both. There's both exist and I shoot both at times. Um, but there's reasons for each one. So just a real brief one as far as raw versus JPEG. This is not going to be on any part of any assignment, just sort of brief overview. Um, so if we went into a store to look at TV sets, you know, you wanted to buy a new TV set, you got your bonus, you're like, I want to look at it, buy a TV set. As we look at different brands of TVs, each brand looks slightly different than the other, even though they're showing the same picture. You can see in this picture on the, up, on the upper left-hand side, there's a three brands of TVs on the upper left-hand side showing the same picture of the dog, the target dog, and they look different because different brands, yeah, they look different depending on what it is. Why, why, is some TV, why are some TVs like that one in here, why is, why is it $9.99 and the one that's just barely smaller is $150 less? Well, sometimes it uh, it's depends on how they portray color in the TV sets, okay? So showing the same movie on different TV sets can produce different results, okay? Different camera brands? Yep, look, they're due. Now, that's not to say that one brand is better than another or one takes better pictures than another. I think all the brands take great pictures. It's not the camera, it's the photographer, okay? So with that in mind, we have to start to think about, okay, how does this apply to us? Well, first off, we have to say, what is a JPEG? What is this thing called JPEG? Well, it stands for Joint Photographic Experts Group. Don't worry about it. It's not that important. Although I had to write a book on it. Uh, it's a lossy compression, which means when you take a picture with a JPEG, the more you save it, the worse it gets. So if I take a picture and I have this amazing picture and I open it in Photoshop and I'm like, okay, I'm going to crop it just a little bit to make it fit. And I save it. And then a couple of days later, you know, I think I want to do I want to go darker and you make it darker. Every time you save it, you lose a little bit of quality, a little bit of quality, a little bit of quality every single time you save a JPEG image. So it's not that it's a bad thing, but we just have to understand how it works. Now, the other problem with JPEGs are it's processed in camera, which means when you take a picture, the camera's processor computer processes it for you and makes it look the way they want it to look. So if we, took, if we were in a class where we actually physically met, and some of you have Canon, some have Sony's, I have Olympus. If we took the same cameras and took the same picture and we shot them in JPEG, I guarantee you they're going to look different because different brands have different looks. Just like, you know, you sometimes when you see a new phone come out, they'll say, well, well this is Apple's new phone and it takes this quality of picture. And then uh, uh, Samsung will say, well, our is better. It does this. Because every single brand camera says, does something slightly different. It's not better, it's just different. So they can process it and make sure that they know that that's a Canon look or that's the Sony look. Uh, JPEG is a universal file type, which means whatever, you, whatever type of computer you use, phone, tablet, whatever, it's a universal type of file. There's no special software needed for JPEGs. It's universal. You can email it, text it, whatever you want to do with it. It's also really small. So that if you have, like I say, a 32 gigabyte card, you have well over a thousand images on that card ready to go. So it's a very small. So there's some really good things. If you take a, have to take a lot of pictures, JPEGs aren't bad. That's not a bad thing. I mean, there are some companies that I shoot for that want me to shoot in JPEG because of the size issues. Uh, so let's just say, so the, that first thing I talked about, I talked about lossy compression. And what in the world does that mean? Well, here's, let me show you what it looks like. So here's a picture of the Golden Gate Bridge. And this is a picture, this is a JPEG straight out of camera. So it's not processed, not anything. And if we look at the picture and we look at the sky, for example, we can see that the sky is an even tonality from top to bottom, from the very top of the sky to where it hits the horizon. It's a very even tonality. You can't see where it stops and changes color. The detail of the bridge, you can see each individual strand of cable for the most part. Okay, you can see each little droplet of waves. If we take this picture and save it a couple times over, we get this instead. 
Now, I know some of you may be watching this on smaller phones or not as good at internet quality, but trust me, this is a vastly different looking picture than the pre previous one. Because if we look in the sky, you can see the detail is vastly different. There's what they call banding. And so the, the lines of, of, the, of the sky are banding because of how it compresses the file. Plus the detail in the bridge is really bad. You've probably seen this when you've borrowed or stolen a picture off the internet for reports. So when you go to Google and you take a picture off the web, you probably see this in your pictures. That's because of this compression problem. Okay, so raw file, it's not an acronym. It doesn't stand for any, you know, it doesn't stand for really awful white balance. It's a slightly compressed file size, so it does make it a little bit smaller. And you have a ton more information that's gathered into the camera when you take the picture. It's just a ton more information, plus which gives you a ton more editing controls. It is a bigger file, which means a 32 gigabyte, gigabyte card is going to hold less than half of what you got with the, with the JPEGs. So it does take up a lot more space, uh, which is a couple of different problems. One is the fact that with this, um, you're going to take up a lot more card space. You're also going to take up a lot more computer space. So there's there's you know there's a balance of everything. <clears throat> It truly does as the name says. It's raw information, it's not processed. So it captures raw data off the sensor. It doesn't do anything, it just captures it and just says, okay, it's, it's, you can do what you want to later on. But the problem is, is it uses some sort of outside program to edit or convert the image. So you can't email a JPEG, you can't email a raw file, you can't print a raw file, you can't text a raw file. It has to be converted to some other concept to be able to work with it. So it's not the easiest thing in the book, easiest trick in the book to work with. But it is what we call non-destructive editing. So as you go forward in your in your in your work with uh, with either photography or video or other things, non-destructive editing is the way of the future. In that, I can go back and get the original back and change it the way I want it to be. So let's say I take pictures of something and I do it for a client. And the client goes, "Um, that's a little too yellow. Can you fix that?" Well, if I didn't uh, if I didn't have it in raw file, I couldn't. But with raw file, I can. Okay. So this is a picture I intentionally took wrong. Don't worry, we're almost done. A uh, picture I took wrong. I took it, this is in San Francisco, took a picture where it's uh, um, the wrong white balance. So shot it wrong on purpose. Well, with, with, with raw file, I can go back and say, you know what, fix it. And it switches it as if it has, was shot that way to begin with. So I say switch the white balance. So in wedding photography, for example, if you're doing wed if you're going to photograph weddings, well, there's a problem in the fact that if you take a picture like this, if this is a JPEG, uh, yeah, her dress is supposed to be white, not orange. You know, that's a pretty orange looking dress. She's probably not going to be thrilled with that. <clears throat> so when you're taking these types of pictures, oftentimes people will have their cameras on what we call auto white balance. Unfortunately, we didn't get a chance to do this, uh, but with auto white balance, it figures out what the lighting is in the room, okay? But let's say you're taking this picture of this wedding, the couple's going down, getting married, you put your camera on this tungsten light bulb, uh, the white balance will automatically change for those yellow lights, like inside of a church type situation. The wedding's over, you know, everybody's, yeah, they go outside, they're gonna do the doves or the bubbles or the rice or whatever they're gonna do. Uh, they're gonna go outside and they're gonna walk down the aisle uh, and you still have your camera on that light bulb setting and it's outside now, and you're gonna have pictures that look like this, which is no bueno, that's not good. That's not good, that's the death of photography. Unless you're like, well, you know what, I felt stylistic, so I'm gonna go black and white. I can make that black and white. <laughs> but if you shot JPEGs in that situation, there's no going back. If you shot it raw file, it's unlimited undoes to where if you shoot it wrong in raw file, you can go back and fix it. Now you can't fix focus, you can't fix bad composition, you can't fix bad pictures or bad timing, but these other controls you can fix with a raw file. Okay, so the easiest way to sort of sum, up, sum it up, you're like, what's the difference between JPEG and raw file? JPEGs are like egos. When you go to buy a JPEG, hang on a second. Why am I in this moment? All right, 
we're finishing up. Almost done. Boy, it's the last time you have to see me struggle with uh, with, right, with full screen stuff. Okay, so JPEGs are like raw files. A rough or J JPEGs are like egos in the fact that when you go to the store to buy ego waffles and you inadvertently buy Homestyle and you get home, you're like, oh man, I wanted the chocolate chip. Can you magically make homestyle Eggo waffles into chocolate chips? Yes, the answer is you could sprinkle chocolate chips on top of it, but it's not quite the same, is it? Uh, because Eggo waffles are essentially frozen cardboard. There's not much more than that. You're not, you know, you don't when you buy a set of waffles from from you know Eggo waffles, you don't know when they were made, where they are made, or how old they are. You don't have no, you have no idea what's going on with these things. That's a JPEG. You really don't have any control over it. You're just going for going along for the ride. <clears throat> better waffle, this is not it. So how do you make a better waffle? You shoot raw file and you go get your, you know, you, you get your uh, waffle maker and you get your Bisquick and you think, well, no, I'm going to put my damn chocolate chips in there. Or I'm going to put my uh, vanilla extract or I'm going to make blueberries or whatever. So that's the advantage of raw file is I get the advantage of doing it. Do you, should you shoot raw file? You can, you don't have to shoot JPEGs no matter what. You can sort of do it either way, um, but you can do what you want to with it, okay? So that's sort of the basics of what I had for today. If you don't have, if you haven't met with me on an individual basis, please either text me or email me, let me know when that would be, when you'd wanna meet uh, or go over that. If you have questions, please let me know and I'll be glad to go over the questions with, you know, any issues you have. Cause again, I don't wanna just throw you under the bus and have you sort of have to figure out how to make this work. I want you to make it work the way it should work for you. Okay, so do we have any questions about what we're doing so far or this week's assignments? Let's see if anybody types in an answer. Heck, you could go bold and go on the screen. Most of you have now, you know, done where you actually can actually see on the screen. So, but it's your call. You don't have to. I'm not going to make you do that. Yep, that's it. Yep, Alejandro, that's just the final assignment. That's I do that because I want you to understand that it's something that I think is really important. So I really want people to focus pun intended, uh, on finishing the final project and getting it done as best they can. And that's why I put so much emphasis on the idea that if you're having, if you're struggling or have a question or whatever, please don't hesitate to reach out and ask me. I'll gladly help uh, with these things. Uh, and last couple of things, one is grades. I know a lot of people ask my grades. So obviously you can figure out by now after six weeks of this, I'm not super hip to putting in grades all the time. Uh, I don't rise and set by putting people's grades in. I go more by the idea of, are you participating? Are you coming to these things? Are you watching it? Are you turning in stuff? So you're fine. If you're watching this, you're probably going to get an A in the class. I'm not a hard grader. I'm just more of a, um, Hopefully people can still hear me, you know, um, uh, hopefully. So anyways, uh, so, but don't worry, grade will be, grades will be caught up this week. So any other questions for the class today? Okay, well, I'm going to let you go with that. Um, please let me know if you have any questions at all. Uh, we'll be able to, yes, uploading class. Will you be uploading class photos? Um, can you clarify, Jesse? When you, you, I mean, do you, do you mean me? I, I know this. I'll be up. I'll be updating the grades today and tomorrow. Um, I'll probably end up doing the final recordings I talked about so many times about going over like a like a critique uh, for people's pictures and stuff like that. So I will be putting that up uh, this week as well. So I apologize for not doing it sooner. Hopefully that answered the question. Okay, good. Okay. Other than that, we are. We are D-O-N-E done, and I look forward to hearing from you this week, and I will get all the grades updated and everything squared away. Other than that, we are done, and I look forward to seeing your work this week. Thanks, and have a great Monday.